Welcome to November the 13th, as I try to remember my dates, we are into mindsets. And I know you guys are probably wondering, why are they jumping to mindsets now? Um, it's extremely important for design thinking. Mindsets is like you see in our illustration, is the foundation for everything that we do. It empowers us to do the part of empathy and ideation and if you don't do these things that Marlise is going to be talking about today, you're going to have a really hard time. You're going to have a hard time. I don't know if anyone's seen that meme, but I'm feeling memeish this morning. So throughout the day, make sure you guys are live tweeting with us again. There's some great conversations that are happening online. Make sure to keep using that hashtag, but as well as um, make sure you're typing in that chat box. Be part of the conversation with everybody that's here today. Um, and you know, if you got questions for him, or at least make sure you drop them in there throughout a presentation. Because Ali's pulling double duty today; he's going to be my co-host, and as well as he's going to be watching the chat box, as well as with Shaylin. So, like with every session, I want to know from you guys: what were some of the analogies that you found for your challenge? You can type it in the chat box. Oh, thank you, Ali. <laughs> I forgot the last part of that sentence. Is it Wednesday today? Yes, it is. We had some, some great homework and we are going to share it, but I want to know from a couple other people in the group, what did you find for your problem, your challenge? Oh, Matthew writes, getting decision makers to share ideas is like children's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. That was a, I like that one. The UC Center is like the AMA roadside visit. Mm. Oh, I like Matthew's second part. Keep it simple. Let them play and provide food. Ah. That's such good. I love it. That's a nice principle out of that. Always reminds me of trying to herd drunk happy kittens. <laughs> right. Let's share with them our uh, favorite ones from what we got from Twitter. So... I am going to say the post-it bandit was at it again and went wild with this one. Um, there are some ones I really, really loved in this analogy. So it's about a service call team. And they said it's the necessity and the ability to answer all the questions like a concierge at a five-star hotel. It was so interesting to think of like, okay, so what do they do there that, you know, brand knowledge and about the ability to follow up on phone calls and provide feedback. That was really, really fantastic. The, the one that I thought was like, okay, there, it's a little bit of a close analogy. It's like listening to clients and issues and concerns is kind of like a counselor or a therapist. So there's some really good insights in there, but it's a little bit close to healthcare. Um, the one that I thought was, it brought a big smile to my face was the establishing an empathetic connection was like speed dating. And the rules are fantastic. It's brief. Time together is monitored. And the experience is quick and in the moment. It's such a really great analogy. So this one, high performance work team is like a su successful sports team. This was another really good one. I would just challenge to be more specific with the sports team. So when you say a, sp a successful su sports team, there's a lot of things that you can list. But I would challenge you to pick Pick one and maybe in a year. So let's say you wanted to pick, I'm biased, Oilers in 1991. What was about them that made them really, really successful? Or maybe it was Toronto Raptors in, was that last year? 2019 when they won their championship. What about them made them super successful and allowed them to achieve that, um, you know, that massive win on such a global scale? And the last one, reporting healthcare risks or events or incidents like reporting an IT issue to the IT help desk or reporting a complaint about a restaurant such as a rating website. And the only one with this one is I would go one step further. So if you're reporting healthcare risk events or incidents, you're probably doing it in real time. You're probably gonna tell a nurse or a physician as soon as it's happening. So instead of it being a reported complaint about a restaurant on a website, maybe it's in real time. Maybe it's like I found a hair there's a hair on my steak. And so how are you kind of engaging and having that conversation? But really, really good analogy. So like I said, you're probably curious, you know, why mindsets? It's because it's this foundational piece of design thinking. So who better than 
the fearless leader of our design lab, to come and talk to you guys about mindsets and culture. Marlies, I see you've already unmuted yourself. I'm <laughs> ready to rock. You can go ahead and share your slides. All right. Awesome. I'm just waiting. Do you see a full slide yet? We sure do. Awesome. Well, thank you for inviting me. I was, uh, I'm both nervous. I get a dry throat when I'm nervous. This is uh, now my, my learning. So I can tell I'm a little bit nervous this morning. Um, so I, I, I was thinking, what does Josh want from me? What, what should I be talking about today? So I'm going to highlight some things and some learnings and draw from the research, believe it or not. Can you believe I even said those words? Um, but first, I wanted to share a short story. Do you see this first slide with the new kid on the block, Josh? No. All right. So I'm not sharing as fully as I should. Hold on. Stop share. Two, two, two. Uh, it's always a little bit convoluted here. All right. I don't understand. Oh, yes. Do you see it now? No. Do you change the slides yet? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I have. Okay, hold on. I hate technical difficulties, people. This is not good. Okay. Marty, do you want us to share? Hold on. Give me two secs. Okay. Am I in now? Uh, we see your present presenter view. Okay. And then if you... Aha. Uh -huh. No, so it's on the other screen now. It's okay. still the presenter view. So just oh. share, share screen, yeah. Okay. Jeez, painful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to need some help here. Yeah. If you click display settings on the top uh, left-hand corner of your um, presenter mode, um, oh. you can just change the screen. Uh, or at least I can share and then you can control. How about that? Let's do it. Okay. I'll give you control. I'm so glad somebody knows what they're doing. I was going to say, Ali, just run down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have control now, Marley. All right. Sometimes it takes a little bit. Next slide, please. So I wanted to tell you a little story about when I first got this job. <laughs> this was four years ago. And I was in a meeting with some very uh, influential people, people at high levels in the organization. And we're in this meeting and I'm the new kid. And you know when you're in a meeting and you feel this emotion building up inside you and you think, should I say something? Because what is the discussion, the way it's going, I, I'm not liking it this is going the wrong direction. So I call it the career limiting move feeling. And so what do you do when you feel that, right? You make a decision, yes or no. Am I going to say something or shall I just hang back and let it evolve? So guess what I did? I decided to speak up. I said my piece. I tried to be articulate and pitch it in the right way. And, you know, after I did it, you know, I, I felt proud that I had done it, but I wasn't sure how it had gone. Then, next slide please, I got this email. Marlies, you're very ahead in your thinking and sometimes you need to let the organizations catch up to your innovative thoughts. Otherwise, you remain ahead but others are still left behind despite all your efforts. Ooh, you can imagine, I was devastated. I was like, oh no, I went too far. I shouldn't have said anything. <clears throat> so how do you think I answered this email, but in the chat box, <laughs> how did I respond <laughs> to this email? Okay, I will tell you what I did. I decided to first phone a friend. Um, I call it the Wolfpack friend. And I said, I got this email, what should I do? And this person said, well, of course you're too innovative. Like that's why you're there. Um, so I answered L-O-L. -L. 
I know, right? LOL, laugh out loud. Is it the organizations who are not ready to catch up or is it, uh, or, or are frontline staff not ready for innovation? And that, I left it with that question. So I answered back and I heard nothing since. So anyways, I went unscathed for that moment in time. Next slide, please. That Arlie, one did, yeah. You, you're missing some of people's responses and they're fantastic. <laughs> okay, tell me, tell me, innovation, tell me. Innovation waits for no one. <laughs> and there's one from Andrew that says, so get on with catching up people. <laughs> I actually shared this email with people in St. John's. I was there a couple of weeks ago, and I, I think I might have had eight people come up to me afterwards saying, I get these emails all the time. I've had those emails. And so I think what was important for me is that just being in this position and, and this, this who I am is that this is, this is the story of my life. I'm going to get a lot of these emails and, and it's, it's day to day business. And so if, if you're thinking of yourself as a change agent, a design thinker or an innovator, you're going to have to get used to those kinds of emails. And so now that I know that I'm going to get these emails I actually I'm inviting them I'm not so devastated again and again and it really helps me kind of cope with being a change agent or a rebel um, and I've put all these words on the screen because I wanted you to see like what what I try to curate from both the literature online what are the mindsets of of the people that we look for um, who are change agents and of course in our design lab next slide please so the first thing is I was really in love with Christina Costello who studied people in organizations who might be thought of as entrepreneurial and she actually interviewed them all and she has a, found a lot of interesting traits but one of the key traits was that you need to try to seed a sense of ownership with people. So your relationship manager, you need to be a very variable likable person so your EQ needs to be right up there and so the difference between likable and liked are different and I was talking to Josh about this earlier um, you can be likable and not necessarily liked so I think some people like me but not everyone likes me but I try to embrace likable traits and the literature actually supports that before we go any into any design event or sprint or any sort of work that we do, we always remind each other and my team in the design lab, like amp up your EQ and be likable because if you're not likable, it's very hard to influence people. Christina also said that the idea is rarely the most unique part of change. It's the people who are trying to implement it. And I think we sometimes forget that. We get caught up with the right strategy, the right way of working. We think that is the answer, but we don't put as much weight on the people who are trying to execute it. So for me, it's rarely about the idea, but more about the people who I'm working with. So as you're creating your team, think about who could advance the cause versus just having three FTEs working with you or one FTE. Instead of a number, who are those people and what are they like? So place heavy emphasis on that. Next slide, please. Oh, the puppy dog. I love this puppy dog. I was listening to the Babson uh, College who has an entrepreneurial program. And um, what I heard there is that Richard Weinluck was a man who studied um, luck. He studied lucky people and unlucky people. So for 10 years, he looked at the traits of lucky and unlucky people. Now, I don't know if I'm a lucky person or an unlucky person, but what I found interesting was he then took it one step further and he put a group of unlucky people in a room and a group of lucky people in the room, but he didn't tell them whether they were lucky or unlucky. And then he gave them both an assignment, the same assignment. He told them, here's a newspaper. I want you to count how many pictures are in this newspaper in as fast and uh, 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 the shortest time possible. So the two groups went to task. The unlucky group took them two minutes to find the pictures in the newspaper. The lucky group took them 20 seconds. Why would it take the lucky group 20 seconds and the unlucky group two minutes? It's because 
the unlucky group methodically went through the newspaper and started counting all the pictures. But the lucky group opened up the newspaper and saw in bold print something that said, stop, there are 24 pictures in this newspaper. Boom, they were done. And so that study illustrated that curiosity, having a mindset to look for the unexpected um, will is an integral part of, of change. Um, and minds change when you look beyond the obvious. So being curious is an essential trait of being a design thinker or a change maker. And I think, um, so think about that as you're developing your muscles. Like these are not things that we're born with. So, and the other thing they, that we've learned from, from creatives is that they try to break routines. They try new things, try to drive to work differently. You have a different breakfast, brush your teeth with the left hand, expose yourself to the surprising, the new elements in life. Um, try to ex expose yourself to these things to feel your creativity. Next slide, please. Um, I love this um, Jackie Dryden with Savage Brands, and she talks about unicorns. And we very much talk about that in our world as well. We, we talk about finding the rare, finding the people who are not trying to be the best, but people who are trying to be the only. So for yourself or for your teammates, what is your brand? What is the thing you want to be known for? And how are you unique? Instead of trying to outdo, how are you different from everyone else? So embrace the different. And that really, for me personally, it has really helped. Once I knew I would never be a really good manager. Sorry, Josh. Sorry, Ali. It's just not my superpower. Start embracing what you're really good at. Um, and we do talk about unicorns quite seriously. I mean, I know it's kind of a joke. But we now know that Harvard Business Review organizations are actually trying to cultivate cultivate rebels. They're trying to cultivate nonconformists and descenders because those are the people who see a new horizon. So don't be afraid to be that descender or to be that rebel because that's what we're going to need if we need new and fresh ideas. Next slide, please. Oh, I love this. Kelly Hurd wanted to look at the role of emotions with creativity. And so again, you're probably surprised I'm raising another research study, but she looked at 200 adults and she divided them up into two groups. And she asked them both to design a potato chip for pregnant women. What would the name of the potato chip be? So she divided the group. The one group was giving the straight up please design potato chips for pregnant women. The other group was asked, okay, before you design this potato chip, why don't you try to imagine being a potato chip, uh, sorry, being a pregnant woman? What would you be craving, right? So one step further, and guess what happened? You can imagine the, uh, the group that was asked to be, you do the emotional exercise, was able to come up with far more creative potato chip brands, margaritas for moms, pickle and, uh, what was it, pickle and uh, salt potato chips. Um, they came up with things that were just really creative. So we now are starting to understand that emotions are key to creativity. So any design session we do, we start with empathy of some sort, whether it's an empathy map, we try to get people into the mindsets of the users because we know we're gonna get far more creative um, answers. Next slide, please. All right, I'm almost done here. Managing discomfort. This is something that if you're going to be a change agent, an innovator, or design thinker, you're going to have to embrace. Managing discomfort. When Christine, Christina started talking to rebels and entrepreneurs, she found out that they, they're usually have about eight ideas or many ideas like an octopus and they're trying to find the smallest of openings to enter their ideas and they were never hurt if it didn't go somewhere because they had many other ideas that they were trying to infiltrate so you have to have be multi-pronged and be comfortable with getting emails like the email i got you're going to hit walls um, of no and i was in a session a couple of months ago and josh was there and someone said but I think you can be bold and comfortable at the same time. Now, I want to, in the chat box, you tell me, can you be bold 
and comfortable at the same time. I personally and the literature would suggest that no, if we're going to be bold, if there's going to be some discomfort. <laughs> Next slide, please. I see the chats flowing in. Last one, reflection. So as a, as a mindset and as a, as a team muscle, think about how you reflect on your practice. Um, this is probably the most important part about a designer or an innovator. They reflect on what's happened and are always insatiable about improvement. So for an example, in my team, um, we have an intake process. We first started with an online survey on our website. Then we went to an email, then we went to a form. And now we've gone to a liberating structure. We use a wise crowd, but we're changing that up again because we feel like it's too fast and it doesn't fit for every inquiry. So we're continually changing a practice. So every session, every meeting, we talk about our work and how we can do it better. Next slide, please. All right, Josh. All right. So we want to hear from you guys. What is a mindset? What would you like to see more in where you work? What is something you wish your team would embrace or you know, teams that you work with that they would embrace? Type that in the chat box for us. Someone said <laughs> embrace change. <laughs> oh, the can-do attitude. <laughs> I love someone types in burn fax machines. <laughs> Yes. Oh. Risk taking. <laughs> uh, I did put, I t tweeted that once. Yes, and is, a, you know, I love working with people who are like, yes, and, yes, and, even though there's a million hurdles and reasons not to do things. I like Olya's more transparency, but real transparency, not just saying we're being transparent. <laughs> I like that legacy practice is not everything. That's so interesting because as we move forward, we have to remember it's always, this is a mindset I really love. Acknowledge the past, but look towards the future. So respect that they're there, but also realize maybe it's the wrong thing. Maybe we are doing the wrong thing. That's one of my favorite mindsets, that ability to look past completely what we're doing. Some great suggestions are coming. Um, Thank you, everyone. Let's let's move to on Marlies. Next slide. Thank nice. you. All right. Um, I tweeted about this on the weekend when I was researching for this talk. Um, I love this. How do we kill consensus before it murders innovation? <laughs> All right. Can everyone agree that we're doing way too much consensus building in healthcare to make decisions? Please, like, shout out. <laughs> Um, it's one of my biggest pet peeves and in our team. So why, why is consensus so tempting? And it's true. It's, it feels safe. It's comfortable when everyone agrees. It's like, yeah, let's do this. Let's all do this. Something incredibly mediocre or incredibly not uh, innovative. So consensus building is, is, is part of our, our makeup. And so getting more comfortable with dissension is going to be key um, and, and, and thinking that dissension isn't negativity. Um, I remember my, my boss's boss, I have many bosses, he said to me the other day, he says, Marlies, you seem unhappy. And I'm like, I'm not unhappy. <laughs> this is who I am. I am not satisfied with the status quo. So that's the makeup of an innovator or a design thinker. You know it can always be better. I once had an operational lead of a hospital say to me, Marlies, our hospital is innovative enough. Thank you very much. And I was like, what? This is impossible. So this is how people think when uh, they're change agents. So don't be afraid to have some dissension. It's how you frame things that's going to be key, of course. So you don't want to turn people off. The other thing that Jackie talked about in her article that I tweeted was hire some rocket ships. Hire some people that, that do descend and have great ideas. Uh, integrate them into your committees because if committee land is going to be part of the world and in our bureaucracies, we won't get rid of committees completely. Um, try to hire different people. Next slide, please. 
So what do we normally do when we want to do a change initiative in healthcare or bureaucracies? Now, I don't know where you're working and what part of the world, but in many large bureaucracies, we start with a steering group. Keep clicking, Ali. We form some working groups and then, oh yes, you got it. Terms of reference, project charters, project plan, comms plan, and then we might get to a pilot and then, yes, you lose the will to live. So this is how we typically approach change. It's the most fascinating thing for me that, that we would do this when we know the literature, we know that people who study change, they know it's not a linear process. They know that this level of bureaucracy will not get us what we want. And yet we do it again and again. So how many... <laughs> How many of you um, are perplexed by this process? Or is it just us aliens here in the design lab? <laughs> Marlies, I think you're giving some people anxiety. There's some people in the chat box are saying it's making them nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Make, making them nervous that I am questioning this process? <laughs> is that what you're saying, You're Joe? showing no. the mirror, Marlies. That's what's <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the man in the mirror. <laughs> I... Um, I, I, I met a startup guy, this was a couple of years ago, and uh, I said to him, you know, we, we build terms of references. How do you respond to that? And he said, I just want to puke in my mouth right now. <laughs> and I just <laughs> laughed so hard. Why are we continuing to do that when we know it doesn't add value to the end result? It, it's really fascinating. So as a designer, start thinking about looking at the world from a different lens, like, is this getting us what we want? Is this truly helping us? Um, next slide, please. Um, before I, I go through this, um, I wanted to tell you a short little story. Um, I was working with someone in, in my current organization and I said, you know, at these committees, we do too many of them. And she said, what? I like committees and we need to have some of these, Marlies. And I said, okay, fine. About six months later, she sent me an email. And this is what the email said. We have had a working group developing a training strategy, capital letters yawn, and holding stakeholder discussions, capital letters yawn, and taking minutes, capital letters yawn, and approving agendas, capital letters yawn, but still no closer to learning tools. Then someone suggested I do sprints. Yay, are you interested in helping us? This was literally an email I got from a senior leader in this organization. And so it was, it's the one I've kept. I would have put it in the slide pack, but it got a little bit muddled at the end here. But so what are we gonna do if, if these steering committees and these working groups in terms of reference aren't the way to go? What is the other solution? Um, what are some other options? First one, Instead of a Gantt chart, when people ask for one, just start looking at some other ways of working. We use Scrum. Um, Josh talks about a burn down chart where you basically list like a ton of activities and you just start going through them. I have to say that maybe your leaders might not be satisfied with a burn down chart because it's not thoughtful enough. <laughs> But a Gantt chart is just a fantastic way of lying, though, Marley. So. <laughs> it's true. Gantt charts are fascinating. Like, how would you know what a month from now is going to happen? It's in a complex adaptive system. It's impossible. So um, I think sometimes a drive a diagram if you have to appease uh, some people that you know what you're doing. Terms of reference. Uh, we are leaning towards value proposition canvases. You can find them online. We will make sure that it's in the email at the end of the session. Uh, it's a different way of talking about adding value. Instead of a pilot, go for a um, prototype and test faster. Instead of focus groups and surveys, observe. And we've talked about this in the past. And if you must strike a working group, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. Um, I know I'm being uh, bold here, but it's, it's, it's a thing that we always do. It, it's so fascinating to me. Next slide, please. All right, the fun part. Who has heard of Brules? Um, so as organizations mature, uh, as organizations merge and become bigger or smaller, we create policies and we create policies and procedures, sometimes for a reason. And when I say rules, I don't always mean 
like it's letter to the law. It's just the way we work, thing, the way we do things around here. It's a perception of how you should do it. So Mind Valley, this guy who runs Mind Valley, he talks about rules. If um, if we start challenging the rules, then we can introduce new ways of working. So think about what you do at your work. So what do you currently do at your work that drives you crazy, that adds no value? Put it in the chat box. What is there? What is What are you doing that adds no value, but it's just something that we always do? What is a rule you disagree with? Team meeting updates, agendas, Project writing charter. your project charter. <laughs> okay, you guys need to do this presentation. It's clear. <laughs> meeting meeting minutes. I don't have to do that much anymore. But the meeting minutes are fascinating. I'm not sure why we do them. Triple charting. Oh, Geraldine, so true. Running everything past my supervisor. <laughs> CCitis, that's what we call it. <laughs> Dress code. <laughs> exactly. Do you want to hear what my rules are? Here they are uh, for healthcare. So it's bigger picture. Best practice over patient experience. Um, how often do we know, do we see that, say, a patient can manage their own blood sugars in a way that, that isn't documented in the literature? They know how to manage it. Um, second, formal training prepares you for doing the job. I mean, this is bold. Um, I've presented this in front of physicians, but do we really need to be formally trained um, to do the job or can we upskill and learn new things? We know that things are happening fast and furious and that the lifespan of a degree or whatever training you had 10 years ago probably doesn't fit anymore. Professionals know best. Awesome. Um, Self-explanatory. You need a strategy before you take action. Um, there's a, a really implicit need of being thoughtful, which I, we appreciate, but building a strategy before you try anything, um, strategy papers, I actually met someone who worked on a strategy, a five-year strategy, and it took them four and a half years to create. Does that not seem crazy to you or is it just me? I don't know. I'm just like, what are we doing? If healthcare is trying to be more agile and responsive, we need to start thinking of different ways of working. Prove your return on investment first. Well, how is that going to work if this is complex and there is no paper or best practice to guide you, um, especially when we're dealing with community and working with patients. Failure is not an option. How can you build in um, failure in healthcare and make it more comfortable for people to take small risks? And we think, think that prototyping is absolutely the way to go because it's small, um, just like a PDSA cycle. And the other rule, the last rule, following a plan over responding to change. How many times have you seen a project plan that there were so many red flags going up, left, right, and center, and people were just wanting to see the plan through. Let's just ride it out. Let's just follow this process to the end of the six months, and then we'll reassess. How many of you have heard that? So these are some of the rules I wanted to share with you, but now I want to just have a quick look, Josh. Is there any juicy tidbits in the chat box? Um. Endless, endless meeting minutes, the business case, the idea that every project needs a business case. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So try to provide some alternatives to, to the people who are asking for this. Um, next slide, please. I wanted to tell you how my first email that I got when I first got here ended. Um, this is a note I got from the person who wrote that email. Dear Marlies, thank you for the great job presenting at Senior Leadership Team in Calgary. I still remember when I first met you thinking that we weren't, as an organization, quite ready for your out-of-the-box thinking. But I know now that you have been a great asset. So thanks for sticking it out with Alberta Health Services. With appreciation, Verna. So this note is posted right here. I can see it every day. And I wanted to close the loop to let you know what happened with that initial Oh boy, I totally screwed up here. Next slide, please. And some of these ways of working, I think was a big, big contributor to getting Design Lab started. 
um, when no one really on the horizon thought that design thinking was something we needed in this organization. So um, next slide, please. And before I pass it over to your hosts, um, the, the definition of innovation is also fascinating in, in healthcare. Um, is innovation doing something that no one else has done before? Yes or no? Next slide. I actually think that innovation means doing what no one else would dare to do. So as you're jumping into your ideation phase within this virtual design school, think about what rules can you break in order to create, be creative and create a new service. Thank you very much, Josh. All right, thank you, Marlies. All right. So I'm looking through the chat box. There's so many, so many comments. Um, too much engagement, Marley. So you have to tone it down next time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Marley, um, there was a question on someone asking was, um, how do you get away from consensus? And any tips and tricks you have in meetings? Ooh, who was that? <laughs> it was our friend Lynn. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. Um, tips and tricks. Um, consensus building, um, if I see we're going down that path, I usually try to take it back to the user. Who is the user and what would they be happy with? For example, I was meeting with a group of home care um, people and the nurse, a frontline nurse said, I spent 80% of my time documenting and, and people just stopped in their tracks. And I, and I reframed and I said, I don't think any taxpayer would want our nurses to spend 80% of our time documenting. Would we not agree? So what are we gonna cut out? So I usually try to bring in um, some examples or um, uh, uh, sort of how other health regions have excelled, like uh, sort of this, um, this is what the rest of the world is doing to kind of get people um, thinking more broadly. Um, Ali, what is a trick you use with consensus building if you feel like we're going down this path and it's um, So I'm gonna cheat a little bit, but I think in our meetings, we try to use dog voting and ways of, of trying to insert a different way of decision-making. So dog voting is another way that we have done and to do expedite things. And also, um, uh, you know, we will talk about it later on, but we get everyone to write individually their thoughts first. Because what happens is we get the hippos, you know, very well, people with the loud voices start dominating the conversation. And so by mm. having everyone putting their poster notes on or putting their thoughts on, everyone is able to share and at least hear all the different perspective before we jump to a, you know, the most loudest voice in the room. It's great, it's great. Okay, well, thank you so much, Marlies. Um, oh, one more question, actually. <laughs> it's an interesting one. I, I thought, you, what's your thoughts on this, Marlies? Is char hyper charting an unintended outcome of risk management? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, hyper charting. Right, and I, and I think I think demands just kept getting placed, new guidelines, new expectations, new reporting, and no one has said, wait, this is, this is going the wrong direction. Um, renegotiating the rules, basically. Um, so those are tough conversations. Um, Thank you, Marlies. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Um, okay, everyone, we're gonna almost to the end. We're gonna just finish over the four, a few more slides. Um, as you guys know, that we are now into um, our ideation phase. We're looking at our design process. Um, next slide, sorry, Josh. Um, we are talking about in ideation, some of the mindsets that we really resonate with me is all about yes and, and going for quantity over quality. And, um, and what happens is, brain, to be honest, uh, brainstorms don't work really well when you're thinking about ideas and going bold. Um, and we want to find ways of how do we encourage everyone to come up with bold and innovative ideas. And to do that, we really have to think about is going for more ideas rather than less and not self-censoring ourselves. Next slide, please. I wanted to share um, my own project that we did. Um, it was with a service program that was helping 
um, rural physicians get better services from um, from the higher tertiary care centers. And their kind of challenge was how might we make it simple and safer for patients and physicians to provide care. And instead of everyone talking and brainstorming loudly, which usually don't work, we got them to put their ideas, to sketch them out. And we did this to an activity called Crazy Eights, which is basically giving them eight minutes to, to sketch out eight different ideas around the topic. We had 10 people in the room. So in eight minutes, we had 50 ideas and it generated a lot of activity and people did it silently. Um, next slide, please. And then we asked them in this group was, take your one, each person, take your eight ideas and take only the best one you think is going to be, you're really proud of and you want to passion about. Now, create into a storyboard. So we took one idea and asked them to put in a three panel storyboard with a beginning, middle and end. Um, and we had some very creative ideas come out. And one of the top ideas that people voted on was um, creating a marketing campaign of how do you attract physicians and let them know about this new service that they're providing. Um, it was a great way of quickly, not just making, getting away from consensus, but also coming up with creative ideas to solve the problem. So next slide, please. So this week, um, what we're doing is asking you to ideate. You guys have been probably been contemplating all about your problems and thinking about you know, solutions. So what we want you to do first is start with the crazy eights. And so you have eight panels. Um, we encourage you to draw and sketch, don't use words as much as possible. And to um, take, a, ideally if you have time constraint yourself, it really helps you to be more creative. So create eight ideas on this eight panel. And then next page, please. When you have created your eight ideas, pick one that you really think is an awesome idea and develop it into a three panel storyboard. So start with the first panel being kind of the beginning of how the idea works. Um, the middle part is all about what's the magic moment, what's the big aha of your idea. And three is how does it end and what's the big impact and kind of your uh, future state. Um, so we want you guys to do this. Um, it's, and hopefully you guys will share it on our uh, Twitter account or also you can send it to us via our email. So with that so conclusion, I'll, sorry, go I'll, ahead. Josh. I'm gonna jump in. So yeah. crazy eights, some key things for you guys to remember. One, draw as much as possible. Try not to use words. I challenge all of you to have as little words as possible when you're going through this. Two, time yourself. A good way to do this is a minute a square. So when we're doing this in a large group, I have a timer going and every minute there's a loud ding. And it doesn't matter if you've done the square or not, you move on to the next one. And it's not about eight different ideas. You can do eight different if you got them. But if you've got one idea and you just want to evolve it eight different ways, go for it and do it. It's all about building. You, and you've got a yes and. We said ideation is a team sport. So if you've, if you've got somebody that you're working with or close with, bounce some of them ideas off them and challenge them to do the yes and. It's actually a really great activity that you can do with people. Just try and build a bridge and have when the next person say no but every single time. Do it for 60 seconds. And then try and build a bridge again, but have them say yes and and see what the difference is like. Just so you can see what the impact. And with the crazy eights, it's not about being a perfect drawer. Everybody knows what a stick figure looks like, what a house could look like, what a hospital represents. Don't worry about it. You're not gonna become the new Da Vinci. That's not what it's about. It's about just putting your ideas to paper. So it's the same thing. A picture tells a thousand words. You're not gonna be able to write a thousand words in a minute, but I know you can write a picture. Sorry, Ali. No, it's good. Um, we could just end it off on our last slide now. For sure. So key takeaways, be curious. Everyone always says like, put your curiosity hat on. I don't wear hats because it always ruins my hair, but always be thinking about curiosity. Always be asking questions. Why are we doing this? How might we evolve this? How might we change? And I'm, you know, challenge yourselves, challenge your team and challenge those org organizational rules. Those things that, you know, you think maybe they aren't adding value to the team or adding value to the organization, or maybe the rules are slowing us down and reflect, reflect, reflect what's working. Did that work? If it didn't, then it's time to shift and move on. Don't pontificate and just think about it. And just change it up. Next week, we have Robin from Radbound. He's going to be talking to us about building. This is all about show, don't tell. Show that MVP, we like to call it. Just 
get something out into the world and uh, make prototypes and share it with groups because pilots belong in planes, prototypes belong in healthcare for rapid change. And that's it. If there's any questions, I encourage you guys to throw them into the chat box. There's still a little bit of time left. If not, that's it from me. Yeah. Ali, is there anything you want to add? No, nope. this has been awesome. Thank you everyone for joining in today. We'll see you nice next week. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Ali, you're controlling my mouse. I'm still controlling my mouse? <laughs> yeah. Stop that. Okay. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs>